50 people joined last two to three days. So I presume they are all the new first year students. Uh, until the official list come to Navneet Singh Ji, who will mail you, you know, individually every Friday or Thursday about the teaching activity we have on Saturday. Till that time, uh, please uh, borrow the link of Saturday teaching program from your seniors. Remember, it is always Saturday morning, 7.30 to 8.30. No inhibition. All the faculty are senior, most professor faculties who are heading training program in DNP surgical oncology or MCA surgical oncology and our examiners and who are the key decision makers of our ISO society, which is the parent body of surgical onco. Please utilize this opportunity. And also one word of caution for all the new students who have joined. Attendance is compulsory every Saturday. Attendance list go to DNB board, NBE. It in turn goes to your teacher and the institution. There is a screenshot and roster maintained. Those who log in and log off and who are not persistently attending, it will be reprimed and note is made by the you know NBE and also it is sent to your institution. So this is not the reason you should join. This is an opportunity which we never had as a student. So today's topic is very tough because it's very easy to do a faculty talk, sit and take a exam classes when you are presenting or preside over the debate. Analyzing a landmark presentation, you know, I always believe when you have a vast, huge topic, one session cannot make justice. What is that one session which can give a screenshot, snapshot of it is analyzing the landmark practice changing papers. Take my word, it takes months preparation. When I had this topic, I had only one person in my mind, my dear friend, Professor, Head of Department, Arvind Krishnamurti of Surgical Onco, Adair Cancer Hospital, one of the oldest cancer hospital, first center in India where MCS Surgical Onco program started. Very academic institution and his area of interest, even though he is very efficient in all the surgical onco, head and neck, breast, thoracic is, is very his strong forte. And he has somebody who has seen through the journey of these changes. Half of his notes is from his MCH when he was in Tata. Remaining notes is from when he's in a professor in a teaching institution. And the last bit, I'm sure after I approached him, he filled the gaps. So it's a fantastic feast. It is like, you know, seeing uh, all, uh, you know, award ceremonies. So please utilize this opportunity. Very tough uh, to do this talk. Thank you very much, Arvind, for accepting this tough topic. I know nobody could do justice other than you. Welcome and over to you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So I think um, uh, at the outset, I would like to thank you, uh, the NB uh, platform, and Navneet Singh Ji for the opportunity. I think uh, really commendable that uh, the NB has been sort of you know, doing this effort consistently uh, for the benefit of the trainees. And uh, uh, today's talk is, uh, as Home said, is is challenging in many aspects. I was actually mulling how to go about it, uh, to talk about landmark papers, to talk about practice changing papers. But I thought, but since most of you all are, are trainees at various levels, I thought I would give you some papers also which are food for thought, so that you can sort of you know do your own studies. And it's very important that uh, we stimulate your young minds uh, so that you are able to sort of. Uh, contribute to the field of oncology, apart from, of course, the re regular patient care. Uh, I must say that it's just a bird's eye view of uh, a lot of trials. In fact, uh, when Soma and I had sort of, you know, started off talking, we thought whether we would cover the entire head neck spectrum uh, in one talk, but I, I felt that oral cancers being our fort was very important. More so, I think uh, you all might know that this is the oral cancer awareness month as well. So. Uh, in a way, it's good that you know, we are having this talk on landmark uh, papers and the practice changing publications uh, uh, during the course of this uh, month. Uh, the list, as I said, is uh, pretty much exhaustive when it comes to practice changing, and I hope in the given time, I will do some justice to this topic. Uh, by and large, if you see head neck cancers, uh, around 3.9% of the entire cancers it contributes. India contributes close to about 60% of the head neck cancer burden. And uh, whenever you want to know something about the uh, epidemiology of the numbers, I would strongly urge you to visit Globocan. 
This is not just for oral cancers, but for many other cancers, they are up to date with the numbers. And here the numbers are where for the lip and oral cavity cancers, uh, about 377,000 cases, new cases, and the deaths would be around 177,000. But more intriguing is that uh, if you see the spectrum of head and neck cancers, it is primarily a disease of Southeast Asia and India, if you see, considering that it contributes up to 60% of the load. So when you study papers from the West or many other centers where the load of in, uh, head neck cancer is low, like for example, in Western world, in Europe, it constitutes only about 3 to 4% of the entire burden of cancers, whereas in India, it contributes, at least in males, more than 30% of the cancers. So what really happens is they tend to pool in all the subsites. When we know the oral cavity has around seven subsites, but in India, considering the numbers that we have, we are able to mine through these individual subsites of oral cancers. For example, in within the seven sites of oral cancer, uh, I must say that tongue and buccal mucosa constitutes close to 50% of all the oral cancers. And we in India are seeing a slight increase in the incidence of tongue cancers. And this phenomenon is also seen globally. And we had also contributed to this in one of the Asia Pacific journals about way back in 2030. So I urge you to look at the epidemiology. And if you see among the oral cancers, the incidence of tongue cancers, especially the ones that are not associated with smoking and alcohol seems to be on the rise. And this is some food for thought, which I feel that you young uh, students should sort of see and explore more. Uh, this is again the global CAN data 2020 of the cancers. Uh, this is the etiological SS of these cancers. Nothing much has changed, but there are some landmark papers and some papers from our end also to know about the role of human papilloma viruses in oral cancers. There is a lot of uh, literature available of oral potentially malignant disorders. In fact, when we were training, the condition was called as oral precancers or oral pre-malignant conditions. That terminology has actually now changed. It is now called as oral potentially malignant disorders. There are a host of oral potentially malignant disorders, leukoplakia, erythroplakia, submucous fibrosis, and submucous fibrosis, I must say, is a problem of Southeast Asia and India caused because of areca nut, which is a level one can, which is a level one carcinogen. Lots of issues with regards to difficulty in access, diagnosis, and management for these patients. Huge amount of data is there with regards to the medical management or chemo prevention of the oral potentially malignant disorders. And I would urge you to sort of, you know, visit the Cochrane database of 2016, which has elegantly summed up the abundant data of medical management or chemo prevention for these oral potentially malignant disorders. In fact, some of the trials have started as early as 1957, the, the, beta, the retinoic acid trials beta carotene, EGFR inhibitors, the famous EPOC trial of erlotinib, COX-2 inhibitors, immunotherapy. There are a whole of a lot of trials. And I must suggest that if you are visiting this paper of Cochrane database in 2016, you will be able to get a good summation of the evidence. And the evidence thus far says that there's no established approach for crevo prevention for these cancers. Although in our regular practices, some of us may be using a lot of the chemo prevention medicines, but if you go from the purely evidence-based perspective, we find that there is no established role for such diseases. What is very important I find was I tended to focus on submucous fibrosis because this is a condition caused by areca nut. It is again a potentially malignant disorders. And what is important for us to understand is the malignant rate of transformation. And this study is a systematic review and meta-analysis that was published in the JCM a couple of months back, showing that the malignant rate for transformation of oral submucous fibrosis was on an average around 6%. However, there was a wide heterogeneity among the studies noted. 
In India, there was a slightly higher than the global average, around 8%. Pakistan seemed to have a much higher incidence of malignant transformation of 27%. So I would urge you all to read the systematic review and meta-analysis published a couple of months back with regards to oral submucous fibrosis. When it comes to biomarkers in oral submucous fibrosis, there is a lot of literature pertaining to the use of biomarkers to predict malignant transformation of leukoplakia and erythroplakia. And I'm not going into all those studies because I felt that oral submucous fibrosis being a sort of an association with Indian oral cancers, it is very important that we do some studies to sort of you know, study this. And I would urge a lot of you all to look deeply into this. Our group had also done some studies with regards to the proteomic expression profiling of some of the biomarkers of oral submucous fibrosis. And we found three secretory proteins, the 1433, the carbonic anhydrase, and the heat shock proteins, which seem to be significantly overexpressed in oral submucous fibrosis vis-a-vis -vis the normal. And we published this data a couple of months back in the Journal of Proteomic Medicine. This has a huge implication in disease prognosis and risk stratification. So whenever you all see uh, oral potentially malignant disorders in terms of leukoplakia, erythroplakia, or submucous fibrosis, we need to stratify them. We need to see whether there is a potential of malignancy in them. And based on that, we have to sort of, you know, treat these particular patients. What is very important in cases of areca nut, which is there in the betel quid that is very commonly used. In fact, in India, if you see three fourths of the tobacco use is in the form of oral tobacco use. It's only very, very few percentage of patients that actually have smoking. And there is a very recent systematic review and meta-analysis published in the Annals of Global Health, which says that after 10 years of quitting of betel nut, you can have a close to 30% risk reversal. Till this time, you never had any data to suggest that quitting betel quit can actually reverse the oral cancers. You had a lot of studies with regards to the smoking, which says that you quit smoking in maybe 10 to 13 years, your risk of cancers may come down. But there was hardly any study to suggest that quitting areca nut in the betel quit with or without tobacco, this is smokeless tobacco, that you could sort of, you know, have a reversal in cancers. And this is one important data, a good systematic review and meta-analysis, which I will urge you all to go and read. With regards to human papilloma viruses in oral cancers, I must say that, you know, it has a definitive role in the management of oropharyngeal cancers. The involvement of the human papilloma viruses in non-oropharyngeal cancers is pretty ambiguous. And we, as a group, sat down and four years back, we actually reviewed the entire Indian literature in the South Asian Journal of Cancer. And we got, and we, of course, Vedang Murthy from the Tata Memorial had done this initiative. So I would urge you all to read this paper, the entire studies of human papilloma viruses in head and neck cancers, including oral, oropharyngeal, non-oropharyngeal, everything has been summated in this paper, whatever the Indian evidence. And I believe that landmark papers have come from India and some, a lot of them have been captured in this publication. This is hot of the press and our group also did some degree of validation of human papilloma virus with regards to oral cancers. And this was published a couple of months prior. It also said that unlike in oropharyngeal cancers, P16 is not a surrogate marker for HPV in oral cancers. We actually said that there is a HPV independent P16 mechanism that seems to drive oral cancer. So all these things is with regards pertaining to the oral cancer carcinogenesis pathway, wherein we feel that the role of HPV in oral cancers seems to be very, very ambiguous, very, very doubtful vis-a-vis -vis oropharyngeal cancers. So it is important to differentiate oropharyngeal from oral cancers. It is also very important to differentiate various subsites of oral cancers. And I would urge you all to read some of these publications as well. The greatest impact in the management for all of us has been the UICC, uh, AJCC, TNM staging and the TNM8 staging. I know Soam had taken an elegant class of uh, AJCC TNM a uh, couple of months back for you all. So it's very important to understand this paper by Lydiate in the 
cancer journal uh, in 2017. In fact, this is major changes has happened in the management or in the uh, in the way we actually approach the oral cancers. The major issues that have happened is the inclusion of depth of invasion, which supersedes extrinsic muscle invasion. So when we were training, we used to sort of, you know, consider ankyloglossia. The presence of ankyloglossia is a very significant factor because it involved the extrinsic muscles of the tongue. And whenever a patient had got ankyloglossia, we used to stage the patient as P4 inoperable and, uh, and sort of you know, wrote them off. But now we find that measuring the extrinsic muscles of the tongue in clinical or radiologically is going to be very, very difficult. Measuring, of course, depth of invasion seems to be much more feasible. And hence, it has been included in the TNM staging of oral cavity cancers. Every five millimeter increase in the depth of invasion, you have incremental stages between T1, T2, and T3, which is very, very important for us to understand. And as trainees, whenever you have a case of oral cavity cancers, you are expected to sort of make a mention of the clinical depth of invasion of these patients. This is a short, short question that you will be asked. This is some practice which you tend, which you, which you should sort of, you know, tend to do in your outpatient cases as well. Although the true depth of invasion would be known pathologically, you must have some idea of depth of invasion, both clinically as well as radiologically. What has other change that has happened is with regards to the extra nodal extension of these cancers. And we knew that if a tumor comes out of the node or involves a node rather, the prognosis drops by 50%. If it comes out of the capsule of that node, it drops by a further 50%. And we knew that extra nodal extension had a very, very poor prognostic factor in many cancers, including oral cancers. But formally in the AJCC TNM8, you have the inclusion of extra nodal extension as a category of N3B, depending of course on the number of nodes. If it's a single node, it could be an N2 disease as well. But if it is more than that with extra nodal pathologically, it would be classified as N2 and N3B. What is more important, and this paper came by the Almeida group, they tended to classify extra nodal extension into three types: no extra nodal minimal extranodal extension, minor extranodal extension, or major extranodal extension. And what this group found is that addition of chemotherapy and radiation benefited patients only if there is a more than two millimeter extranodal extension, but not in patients in which there is a less than two millimeter extranodal extension. So even within the extranodal extension, now there is a philosophy of studying how much of extranodal extension has been there. With regards to the management, and this is a, a screenshot of what the management broadly looks like, I thought I should sort of, you know, rather than going into individual trials, I should sort of, you know, give you a mechanism in which you tend to sort of, you know, trace the pathway of the patient across the management and try to understand what are the nuances or advances that has happened during the course of the management and I'm highlighting to you landmark papers that have actually impacted the practical management of these patients, whichever you see in your outpatient on a daily basis. So by and large, I think students, I request you to sort of, you know, keep this broad picture in mind. So whenever you're seeing a patient of oral cancer or beat any head neck cancer, you tend to divide them. I know, of course, there is a formal TNM staging. We discussed that in, with regards to oral cancers, but broadly, you tend to divide these patients into early stage wherein you do a single modality treatment, either surgery or radiation therapy. And I'll come to some of the landmark papers that actually dealt into these evidences as well. And with regards to or locally advanced cancers, stages three and four, you would have a combined modality. So by and large, whenever you are reading any paper of oral cavity cancers, or for that matter, any head neck cancer patient, uh, you tend to sort of, you know, have this broad schema in your mind before understanding the entire concepts. There was, in fact, a randomized controlled trial, and this was by Gopal Ayer's group from Singapore, published in Cancer in 2015, comparing surgery versus chemotherapy and radiation in advanced non-metastasic squamous cell carcinomas of the head and neck. A 10-year update showed that the five-year disease-free survival of oral cancer patients 
who were treated with surgery was 68%, who were treated with chemotherapy and radiation was a meager 12%. So you have a randomized control trial also if you uh, although you see in some of the ncc and guidelines you may find that surgery they would say preferable but they would also say some amount of leverage for radiation therapy also and there is some evidence to sort of go for radiation therapy in very select cases but this landmark paper is a randomized control trial published by one of the groups in singapore that said that whenever possible you will have to offer surgery for these patients Another landmark paper which is there has been the National Cancer Database. From 2004 to 2013, more than 20,000 patients, they said, they again compared primary surgery with radiation therapy in early stages oral cancers. And they did find again that primary radiation therapy was associated with the increased mortality. And they also suggested, I'm sure, that patients with the highest risk of receiving radiation therapy was, of course, they talked about some racial discrimination also that is uh, that tends to happen at times uh, uh, and, uh, and disparities in cancer care rather uh, in terms of elderly black patients receiving uh, radiation therapy as compared to surgery this is the elegant paper by Harold ellis published in the otolaryngology head neck surgery 2018 so i would urge you all to go and uh, dwell more into this paper the larger message in both these publications the randomized control trial by gopal Iyer, and the National Cancer Database is whenever there is an early stage oral cancer patient, you will have to do upfront surgery for these patients and only in, in certain indications in which the patient is uh, unfit, unwilling, or because of severe cosmetic indications, you may choose to perform radiation therapy in these patients. Otherwise, the evidence in terms of randomized control trials and in terms of this large database significantly points to surgery for the early stages oral cancers and also the advanced stages as well as the randomized controlled trial showed. Is it the end of radiation therapy? Very recently, the ArcScan 2 study was published in the Radiotherapy Oncology Journal a couple of months back. A prospective randomized controlled trial accelerated preoperative radiation therapy compared with surgery and conventional postoperative radiation therapy in these patients. 250 patients again they found no statistical difference between the two arms, be it accelerated preoperative radiation therapy followed by surgery or surgery followed by the conventional postoperative radiation therapy. So the concept is not completely off. People are trying to use more and more of chemotherapy and radiation therapy, especially in the organ conservation protocols. And this is there, this is slowly uh, sort of you know, coming in the domain of oral cancers as well. But the famous ArtScan 2 study published a couple of months back showed that there is no significant difference. In fact, the toxicity was more pronounced in the preoperative accelerated fraction radiation therapy. More often in the clinics, what we see is locally advanced oral cancers. There's a concept of borderline or technically unresectable and unresectable cancers. And this is a very contentious area, but I thought that we must delve into the, this, especially in terms of the evidences that we would sort of practice in our clinic. And there is a lot of evidence, maybe not be randomized evidence, uh, to suggest that neoadjuvant chemotherapy may be the way to go. There is some limited evidence to go in for chemotherapy and radiation therapy, but it seems to have a limited role in oral cancers which are borderline or unresectable. And this is something that I want you all to sort of uh, remember. There seems to be a criteria for defining the borderline or technically unresectable. Of course, this is subject to change. Uh, some people may tend to operate one or few of these patients, but it is very, very important in oral cavity cancer management or for that matter, any cancer management that you achieve negative margins. Because if you are getting an R1 resection or a positive margin in any sort, then you are doing your patients a, a lot of harm. Buccal mucosal cancers with peritumoral edema extending up to the zygoma as seen in this cartoon, tongue cancers extending to hyoid, oral tongue extending to valicula, high ITF involvement, especially the medial ITF involvement, especially of the lateral pterygoids and extensive skin infiltration. One odd patients, you may be able to do upfront surgery and get an R0 resection, but by and large, most of these uh, criteria have been defined as borderline or technically unresectable. And if you use the practice of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, about 40% of the patients 
can come into the realm of surgery. And if you do surgery for these patients, you are giving them a survival advantage. And you have got a lot of publications from the medical oncology group of TMH right from 2013 to 2021. Um, uh, they had published. There is a lot of uh, role of two drug versus three drug NACT. That is traditionally, if you give three drug, uh, the new adjuvant chemotherapy as a TPF, you seem to have a very, very good response rates as compared to the TP, but then at a trade off of slightly increased toxicity. Very recently, a thought provoking uh, article from the, uh, from the TMH group, they combined the maximum tolerated chemotherapy with oral metronomic therapy. Very recent publication that came out in uh, early in late December in 2021. Paclitaxel and carboplatin combined with oral metronomic chemotherapy are in very interesting concept and they showed quite a bit of promise and they are trying to take it up. So by and large, whenever you have a locally advanced cancers, if it's resectable, go for surgery. But then if it is borderline resectable, if you have some doubt that you're not able to achieve clear margins by any of these criteria, then you tend to go towards neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And there is a lot of Indian evidence to back this practice as well. Very recently, the TMH group led by Devendra Chowkar, they used the NACT for the mandibular preservation. Organ preservation is a huge thing in head and neck cancers, especially to do with the larynx preservation and hypopharyngeal cancers in both larynx and hypopharyngeal cancers. But this seems to be a, a, a new, newer concept. In fact, not that new. In fact, if you see the Lisa Lesitra's randomized controlled trial of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, you find that 21% of patients, you can avoid a mandibular resection if you use the neoadjuvant chemotherapy approach. And there is a phase two data which has come out from the TMH that showed that in 16 patients out of 34, that's close to about 47% of the patients, you could preserve the mandible with acceptable toxicity and no compromise in survival. They are, there is an ongoing phase three randomized control trial, and this is actually food for thought, especially in cancers which have extensive paramandibular spread and no obvious invasion of the mandible. So this is some exciting new advance that seems to have creeped in in the sphere of oral cancer management of mandibular preservation. But I must let you know that this is just food for thought. This is not come into the regular practice to data as we are awaiting a phase three randomized control trial for some of these patients. When it comes to margins, and this is very, very important for a surgical oncologist to understand, and I actually mentioned briefly about this in my earlier slides as well. Every attempt has to be made to have a margin negative resection, and the concept of margins keeps changing in many cancers. With regards to head and neck cancers, a clear margin would be to have a more than five millimeter histologically negative margin. Anything less than that would be a closed margin. Anything less than a millimeter would be considered a involved margin. And in case of head and neck cancers, anything that is close or anything that is involved has a poor prognostic factor. There are a couple of studies by the uh, Memorial Sloan Catering Group that say 2.2 millimeters may be good, or the David Coleman's group that said like you know, about three millimeter margin can be reasonably, but they are not something that you must try to do by design. If by default, like you know, you're aiming for a uh, five millimeter margin by going about a centimeter or two around the tumor, you land up with one of the margins being slightly close. I think that is uh, that is not by uh, design. It is by default, but by design, you must sort of, you know, try to achieve a histologically negative margin of more than five millimeters. A lot of talk, and this is a practical utility point of use of frozen section, a heavily debated topic. A lot of us tend to use frozen sections at least in the Indian context, whenever it is available. But if you actually see the evidences for frozen section, it has actually failed to, uh, to improve survivals or oncological outcomes uh, in many of the studies. And I would urge you to study uh, the meta-analysis published in the head and neck surgery by Mustafa Bulbul, which says that even if you had a R1 resection and you cleared the margin based on your frozen section, to R0, it didn't seem to have an impact on the uh, local control rates for these patients. It's a meta-analysis of about five odd studies 
which showed that revision of margins from R0, R1 to R0 did not have an impact in terms of the local regional control of these patients. And I would urge you to have uh, another study by Pankaj Chaturvedi and group. They had a cup two studies, a retrospective study that showed that use of frozen section was not cost efficient in terms of oral cancer management. And the group also showed, and this is a very practical tip where, which I felt that, you know, practicing surgeons and trainees should sort of keep in mind especially if you're practicing in centers where frozen section facility is not available, if you are able to achieve a gross margin of seven millimeters all around the tumor verified intraoperatively, then it seemed to obviate the need for a frozen section examination. Of course, the group and Pankaj is actually doing an ongoing randomized control trial of gross examination, seven millimeters margins was vis-a-vis -a, -vis a frozen section uh, margin. So this is a work in progress. But I must say that if frozen section facility is not available, you tend to go wide and get try to get a seven millimeter gross margin. If you tend to have a frozen section facility available, use it jud judiciously. But at the end of the day, if you are able to get more than five millimeter margin, you seem you will be good in all your oral cavity cancer patients. People have also tried to look at some to do something more, and I'm sure that you know technology is trying to push us to sort of give us better margins in terms of fluorescence, visualized margins intraoperatively. A lot of devices are available in the market, and I must urge you not to get swayed by some of these devices. There was a randomized control trial published in the JAMA late in 2020 based on an observational study initially published in 2016 what they found is flow fluorescence visualized guided surgery seemed to slightly have a better local regional control rate they did a randomized control trials about 457 odd patients but they actually it was a negative study the local recurrences rate actually did not sort of was no different between the groups. In fact, if you say it was slightly higher in the fluorescence visual guided group as compared to the non fluorescence uh, guided group. So I must say that you tend to trust your naked eye slightly much, much more and try to go by the gross examination of these tumors to get a good margin. All these adjuncts are there, but I think it should sort of, you know, not sort of you know, cloud your judgment. Uh, for a good intraoperative palpation of the tumor to achieve a negative margin. The management of uh, the neck, and this is a very important um, uh, space wherein we are we are really proud of uh, uh, what the, the TMH and Dr. De Cruz has contributed. This is a landmark trial which I feel that everybody should sort of you know read. Uh, prior to 2015, the NEGM publication, there was an equipoise of whether to observe an N0 neck and do what is called as a therapeutic neck dissection or whether you should do an elective neck dissection for early stage oral cavity cancers T1, T2, which are clinically and radiologically N0. About 596 patients, 10 years, 2004 to 14, 500 were evaluated. A majority of them were oral tongue cancers, 245 in the elective group, 255 in the therapeutic group. After a mean fodder, median follow-up of around 49 months, they the elective group had 89, 81 recurrences as compared to 146 in the therapeutic group. So an overall survival advantage of uh, or it was the elective group at the OS at three years was 80%. The therapeutic group, it was a 67%. So there was a 12% advantage in terms of OS. In terms of DFS, there seems to be around a 23% advantage. That is 45% uh, DFS in the therapeutic vis-a-vis -vis 70, close to 70% in the elective group. That That is, if you do, uh, uh, you can prevent one recurrence if you do every four with every four neck dissections and you would save one life if you do every eight neck dissections and this is the greatest implication and this has actually changed the way in which we sort of you know manage early node negative oral cancers subsequent to this seminal publication there was another randomized control trial after the publication of the uh, the tmh study uh, hutchison's group from the uk uh, they were doing a randomized controlled trial called the SEND study, and this trial was prematurely closed, but both 
Dr. De Cruz's paper and Dr. Hutchison's paper seem to suggest that the benefit of elective nodal dissection was there in all subgroups. There was a small debate as in oral cancers less than three millimeters, whether the benefit uh, of thickness, whether the benefit of elective neck dissection was there. In fact, the Hutchison's group paper, which was published in the BJC in 2019, said that the benefit was there even in the group of three, less than three millimeters. Subsequent to this seminal publications of um, the, from the TMH group and by the Hutchison's group, there have been seven meta-analyses that has come. And uh, all these uh, things are there. You can sort of read through all these meta-analyses and almost all the meta-analyses have uniformly suggested a benefit of elective neck dissection in terms of overall survival outcomes uh, as compared to the, uh, to the uh, watchful waiting group. So there is no, absolutely no debate. Now that you'll have to do a elective neck dissection, you should not do rather a watchful waiting in N0 neck of early stage oral cancer patients. Also, there is a seminal uh, publication from the ASCO clinical practice guidelines. I would urge you all to read this. What to, how to approach the oral cavity and oropharynx. There is a clinical practice guideline. Also, there are some NCCN guidelines. They say that to do a, a good neck dissection, you must harvest at least 18 lymph nodes. There is a lot of buzz about the performance of sentinel node biopsies. And the buzz seems to have happened because close to 70% of the patients in the randomized controlled trials, you would actually have an N0 neck for these patients. So whether we could do something, uh, that, that means they were pathologically N0 as well. And we didn't really know which of the 30% of the patients actually harbored the group. So there was some interest in a lot of groups to see whether sentinel lymph node biopsy could answer some of these questions. And there were three seminal randomized controlled trials, which, which I uh, which would urge you all to read. One is a SEN trial published in the EJC much earl earlier. Two very recent trials, of course, this all came during the thick of the pandemic. The group from the Japanese, the Hasagawa group in the JCO a couple of years back, and the Sentimoral trial, which was published by Garrel uh, in uh, JCO 29, 2020. Of course, there's one more randomized control trial, and I would urge you, this is a very, very interesting concept of uh, sentinel node biopsy as we mine the evidence. There were a lot of thought-provoking issues um, in terms of uh, the critiques of these trials. They said that a lot of these trials were actually non-inferiority trials. They assumed a non-inferiority margin of 10 to 12%, whereas in actual practice, you may not have that much of a non-inferiority margin. At best, you may have some 5% non-inferiority margins. But what happens is during the performance of the rand of, of some of these randomized controlled trials, you tend to dis have a very pragmatic design because you want to actually accrue your patients based on the power of your study so that you complete the accrual that may so that it becomes a randomized control trial. So a lot of times you actually select the design of the trials in such a way or select the endpoints of the trial in such a way that you're able to sort of you know accrue patients and you're able to complete the surgery in time. If you are to do a randomized control trial between sentinel node biopsies and elective neck dissection in early stage oral cavity cancers with overall survival as the endpoint, the numbers you would require is much, much higher, anywhere between 600 to maybe 1200, considering that the difference between the two groups is very, very marginal. But because it is very, very difficult to accrue trials, a lot of trialists tend to actually use much different designs and the non-inferiority design is one such. And also in terms of the endpoint that they use in, in clinical trials, instead of using overall survival as an endpoint in some of these uh, uh, central node biopsy trials, they have used local regional control as some of the endpoints. But I feel these, these are all reasonable endpoints. A lot of thought process goes into designing a couple of these randomized control trials, especially if you're not able to accrue patients that far. There's no point in designing a randomized control trials that is, uh, and you are not able to recruit patients or accrue patients for that particular trial. So a lot of the trials of sentinel lymph node biopsy compared in elective neck dissection were very pragmatic trials. 
they were designed as non inferiority assuming a slightly higher non inferiority margin of 10 to 12% in the hasagawa trial and in the sentimoral trial so that they could accrue the patients on time despite that in the sentimoral trial they were not able to accrue the patients in the given time they actually accrued the patients over an extended period of time and subsequently they included 12% of patients of oropharyngeal cancers also in the oropher in the oral cavity so although the trial was actually designed to address the issue in oral cancers just to uh, achieve the accrual they tended to actually include 12% oropharyngeal cancers and we know that in oropharyngeal cancers it, although you have nodal metastasis they tend to have a good prognosis and of course there are issues in which you measure for example considering that the survival outcomes are not that greatly different they also have the main importance is to measure the quality of life in terms of shoulder morbidity and cost effectiveness and in some of the trials they were not addressed there were some issues with the choices of the adjuvant treatment for example in in uh, some of these trials uh, radiation therapy was uh, was not given to one node positive patients sentinel node biopsies if they had some disease isolated tumor cells or micrometastases they were not clear, cleared extra nodal extension some patients were not given chemotherapy and radiation therapy as a standard of care so if you mine these uh, publications you get a lot of these technical issues so and very recently and very interestingly also i would urge a lot of you all that this is hot of the press at tejpal gupta's group again from the tmh mumbai they have done some seminal work on having a systematic review and meta analysis and this was published in oral oncology again a couple of months back they did a meta analysis of the trials and they found that there is an oncological non inferiority of sentinel node biopsies as compared to elective neck dissection and but with better functional outcomes of sentinel node biopsies as compared to neck dissection so of course this data was based on the uh, on all patient but when they tend to uh, do an uh, the individual patient data analysis what they found and they sort of you know extracted it from the kaplan meier graphs and they sort of you know came up with a graph they found that the oncological outcomes was exactly the same from the systematic review and meta analysis of the randomized control trials especially of the two randomized control trials of the hasagawa trial and the sentimoral trial so in effect what they say is there is a non inferiority although equivalence has not been established considering the numbers were slightly small you require slightly higher numbers to actually show show equivalence but what the group suggested was sentinel node biopsy seems to be a viable alternative a standard of care in patients with early stage oral cancers which are known negative and this is sub published in the jco last month so i would urge you all to read this i am uh, there was a lot of technical information that i gave during the last two slides but i would urge you all to sort of read all those things so that you can get to understand or we can possibly discuss this also in the q and a if possible so although there is a lot of buzz of sentinel node biopsies i must say that for now we know that it is it is a safe procedure it can be very uh, done in a in a very standardized manner it is non inferior although equivalence has not been proven and if you see some of the guidelines they say that there is a level 1 evidence to do a uh, or recommendation rather to do a sentinel lymph node biopsy also in early stage oral cavity cancers again uh, now quickly moving on to the principles of reconstruction regional flaps versus free flaps i think uh, we've uh, done some work on it we've described a couple of other flaps like modified submental infra hyoid and all these flaps believe me like you know although free flaps are the standard flaps but you do tend to use a lot of the regional flaps and i must urge you all to sort of you know be well versed with understanding the anatomy of the head and neck region especially with when with the performance of some of the submental flaps or infra hyoid flaps or fam or supra clavicular some of these flaps are very very useful Uh, some of these flaps can be a uh, useful in the in the salvage setting uh, for the patients as well or in when free flaps have failed so i must urge you all of course free flaps are definitely cosmetically superior but oncologically both regional and free flap seems to perform equally good in terms of oncological outcomes and we uh, understand anatomy and try to know some of these other flaps very quickly during the last part of this thing i would try to sort of you know go through uh, some of the uh, issues 
pertaining to chemotherapy and radiation therapy because as surgical oncologists we sort of you know train you to sort of you know understand the nuances of chemotherapy and radiation therapy also uh, you must be uh, familiar with the mac and c role of chemotherapy uh, uh, started uh, i think a lot of updates have come in fact uh, when i was training uh, uh, also at the pmh at 2000 the first uh, update came 2009 another update came and this update is in march 2021 update of 107 randomized control trials with close to 220000 patients of mac and c meta analysis and using all data from randomized control trials and they found that, that the usage of concomitant chemotherapy and radiation therapy the absolute benefit was around 6.5% at 5 years and 3.6% at 10 years uh, adjuvant chemotherapy after surgery or radiation therapy, they did not uh, uh, give a good overall survival or even free survival. And they actually said that NACT with TP was uh, with platinum 5FU was slightly better than uh, slightly TPF. And this is something that maybe uh, during the course of the QA, if you are interested, we can go to this. Slightly uh, different conclusions from the MAC NC analysis, but this is some food for thought for you all. The other Thing I would urge you all to study is the Cochrane meta-analysis, which came up again uh, December 2021, which said no clear benefit of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, but adjuvant chemo RT in high-risk patients, I would come to it in the latest slide, actually reduces the risk of death by around 16%, and chemotherapy and radiation therapy as compared to RT alone, more than 20% improvement in overall survival. There's a combined meta-analysis from the McKinsey group and the March collaborative groups, also with regards to chemotherapy and radiation. And this is generally for head and neck cancers, not specific for oral cavity cancers per se. They are trying to investigate whether addition of induction chemotherapy or hyperfractionated chemo RT seems to be beneficial over for these patients. And these are very wonderful landmark uh, publications which actually have set the stage in which they have pulled in a lot of the data of trials that have actually been there for about three or four decades. Uh, I would now tend to focus on a lot of randomized controlled trials that have come in the adjuvant treatment for high risk patients. And of course, this is a, a, a couple of two publications have come back to back in the NEGM. This was at the time when I was training at the TMH. So you had the EORTC 22931 trial again which showed that chemotherapy and radiation therapy in the adjunct actually found no significant differences. But subsequently, there was a pooled uh, analysis of both the trials, the EORTC trial and, and the RPOG trials, which actually set the stage for what we are practicing in now. A significant benefit of adjuvant chemotherapy and radiation is there in extracapsular extension and when your surgical margins are involved. Definitely doesn't seem to have a role when two or more histologically nodes were involved. This was one of the inclusion criteria in the RTOG trial. Of course, there was a trend to benefit of adjuvant chemotherapy and radiation therapy when you had uh, multiple other factors like stage 3 or stage 4, PNI, LVSI, multiple nodes in level 3 and level 4, or which are uh, secondary to tumors arising from the oral cavity or the oropharynx. So this has actually set the stage for us to whatever we are practicing today is thanks to these uh, randomized control trials and the, the pooled analysis of the randomized control trials in which we are using adjuvant chemotherapy and radiation therapy in the high risk patients as defined by extracapsular extension and positive margins. Of course, there is a soft indication to use it in the other subsites as well. Again, there's a lot of uh, thing is to what dose of chemotherapy of cisplatin you have to do in, in the adjuvant setting, high risk setting, 100 milligrams per meter square uh, standard. But at times, there is a recommendation to use a low dose cisplatin also, about 40 milligrams per meter square as well, uh, which has been sort of endorsed by a lot of guidelines despite the absence of a robust level one evidence. Again, finally, in the recurrent and the metastatic setting, it's very important to do salvage surgery for these patients. And there's a lot of data which is comparing uh, salvage surgery uh, uh, or propagating salvage surgery. I, I know that, you know, the lack, lack of randomized control trial, but I, this, is one, this is where I feel a clinician judgment is very, very important. You must know to mine the data. 
Whenever a patient has got a short disease free interval, advanced tumor stage, extra nodal extension, positive margins in the recurrent tumor, regional recurrence, all these things pertain a, pertain a very poor prognosis. But I must say that in the event of the recurrence, if you are able to perform a good salivate surgery, judicious use of free flaps in these patients, you must liberally use free flaps. And there, here I feel that good vascularized tissue is very, very important for healing. You give the best survivals for these patients. No other treatment you are able to match the amount of overall survivals that you're getting. But having said that, uh, this was the paradigm earlier. But now what has happened is you have a lot of therapies that have actually challenged the dogma of doing salvage surgery, especially when you have impressive survivals with use of novel systemic therapies and immunotherapies. So to position salvage surgery in the era of novel systemic therapies and immunotherapies seems to be a challenge for all of us. And this is another landmark paper by uh, Vermarken in the NAGM in 2008, one of the first trials to show a survival advantage of using a combination of cetuximab, platinum and 5-fluorouracil vis-a-vis your standard therapy of platinum 5-fluorouracil. First trial to show an overall survival uh, advantage of around three odd months. And it, it was a very landmark publication at that time because prior to that, no therapy had actually showed an overall survival advantage. One another study, and this was by the Barbara Bertner's group, which was published in the Lancet a couple of years back. This has also revolutionized the way in which we are uh, sort of you know, advocating the practice of head neck uh, uh, systemic therapy, essentially, especially in the recurrent and the metastatic setting. This was one of the trials in which it showed immunotherapy, uh, pembrolizumab, as either as a monotherapy in the PDL1 positive tumors, but that is with a CPS score of more than 20, preferably, or more than one also. Um, a, and a combination of pembrolizumab and platinum and 5-FU in the first line setting for a recurrent and metastatic. So the extreme regimen was the first regimen to show an overall survival advantage, again, in the first line setting. And the Keynote 48, which compared pembrolizumab monotherapy or a combination of pembrolizumab and chemotherapy with the extreme regimen showed an overall survival advantage. So now it is actually, since a couple of years, this the management of recurrent and metastatic cancers have actually, the guidelines actually have changed following the publications of the Keynote 048 and also the Checkmate 141 trial of nivolumab. So there's a very complex algorithm in which how you sort of, you know, go about the management of some of these patients. Uh, a lot of decision making tree. This is very important. Actually, you tend to divide your patients into platinum resistance and platinum sensitive. Take the CPS score, take the disease trajectory and then decide what is the first line, second line and third line. Training. So a lot of exciting work because whatever, no matter what you do, close to 50 percent of your locally advanced head neck cancers are going to recur. So salivate surgery, although it's the backbone of these patients, you know have got exciting data in terms of immuno-oncology to say that you have very, very impressive survivals in a select group of these patients. But the problem is that although these have been there in the guidelines, only 2% of the patients in the Indian context are able to sort of, you know, afford some of these therapies. So it's very, very important that in the low and middle income group setting, there is no point in having a guideline and having some drugs which are which you are not able to give for the vast majority of the patients. And this I must commend the group of the medical oncology at the TMH for coming up with some landmark publications of oral metronomic therapy, showing it as a pro, uh, as a promising practical option in patients. Of course, there was a phase three data published in the Lancet a couple of years back to show that it is superior to single agent cisplatin. Of course, there are a couple of issues with the trial. And very recently also in the JCO, the promise of a triple drug metronomic therapy showing about a impressive OS of around 61% and an impressive PS of 34.5%. Uh, so this is again food for thought. It is very important for us to have some Indian solutions to our problems. Immunotherapy is very difficult and 
it is very important for us because most of the times now we are trying to give either a two drug or three drug metronomic therapy for these patients. So again, precision medicine that's also taken over in a big way. And there is an ASCO provisional clinical opinion guideline that has come a couple of months back to sort of, you know, suggest how to go about because there is a lot of tumor agnostic approvals that have come for patients. For example, patients with high tumor mutational burden, tumor with the high MSI, NTRAC mutations, RET mutations, you have got tumor agnostic approval for some of the immune oncology agents. There's a lack of clarity in, in some of these in, and to whom to do genomic sequencing, how to go about the test, how to order, what assay to use, how to interpret the results and how to select the patients. There is an ASCO guideline and I would urge all of you all to sort of, you know, have a look at these guidelines to better understand um, in the era of uh, precision medicine, it's very important for us as uh, uh, oncologists also, it's very important to understand how to sort of manage these patients, especially if, uh, considering the fact that most or majority of our patients are locally advanced, a lot of them are prone to recurrence. It's very important for us to have some sort of level of understanding on the genomic sequences of these patients. And I'm sure the ASCO guidelines will be a useful uh, thing for you. And this is again, a, just a food for thought, a randomized controlled trial in palliative or end of care setting also. A very, very simple, dry, simple trial design. And, and I've put this publication just to tell the youngsters that even if you are there in a low resource setting, you can still do a wonderful randomized control trial. Like this wonderful trial is called the Silence Randomized Control Trial, published in the JAMA late last year. About 162 patients in hospice care using subcutaneous scopolamine versus placebo. And they seem to suggest that the death rattle in these patients decreased from around, around uh, uh, sort of from 27% to 13%. So this I put just to stimulate your young minds that you don't really require abundant resources to sort of do a randomized control trial. All you need to do is understand the subject, have passion and try to see what are the gaps in your patient care. And you can design some simple randomized control trials. And this is clinically meaningful. You're able to do some benefit for these patients, as was the meaningful benefit that you could achieve with some of the other systemic therapy agents also. So some future perspectives. Again, our group has done a lot of work in terms of microenvironmental landscape, immune landscape. And this is something that is we are not going to escape from this. Believe me, like, you know, this may sound hi-fi, but this is the way in which the world is going in, in terms of, you know, high risk pathological criteria, emerging uh, fields of microbiomics and metagenomics. So this is something that, you know, we have to sort of, you know, uh, 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 focus some attention, try to understand it. Our group, again, the Hitchcock group has got some work in, in terms of high risk histological features. About 742 for all our patients, we tend to pull out. And I, I'm sure this is just one of the things many groups are trying to pull our data. And we found a model in which we tended to prognosticate some of our high risk oral cavity cancer patients. And this was a study that was published in the head and neck a couple of months back. Finally, I think uh, I just would uh, leave some slides for the role of oral cancer screening in which India has made a landmark uh, landmark uh, role in, in the global map. Uh, over the years, you've had a modest improvement in the five year survivals. Of course, what has happened is the Survivals of head neck cancers, if you see it is increased from 55 to 66% over many years. And what this has happened largely because of HPV positive oropharyngeal cancers actually giving a better prognosis for the patients. So the improvement in survivals has actually happened in the West. It has happened largely because it is driven by the HPV pandemic in the Western countries. Whereas in India, if you see, wherein we don't see that much of a HPV driven pandemic, in case we, we see a lot of oral cavity cancers, still you have a lot to do in terms of survival. And there is also compelling data to say that, you know, some of the head neck cancers, the incidence is going to rise by 30 to 40% in a couple of decades, and so will be the mortality. So from the public health perspective, it is a public health problem whether we can do oral cancer screening. And of course, you have the Kerala model, the oral cancer screening model by Dr. Shankar Naran et al., which was published initially in the Lancet in 2025, an updated version in oral oncology 2013, over 200,000 patients, close to that, a 15-year follow-up. And mind you, this oral screening was performed by health workers it showed a 12% reduction in, in all in mortality in all individuals. 
a double the reduction in tobacco uses, a 38% reduction in incidence and 81% reduction in mortality when you actually focused on the tobacco and alcohol users, especially if they adhered to the four rounds of screening program. So this is a good randomized control trial. And in fact, very recently in the JCO, the Kerala model is actually used as one of the model to actually promote what is called as a risk-based screening for oral cancer patients. And this is a publication by Cheong et al. Uh, last, late last year in the JCO. Again, certain uh, some thoughts on oral cancer screening, past, present, and future. And this was an elegant article in the JDO by Varnakala Surya. In fact, you, he has a lot of publications on oral potentially malignant disorders also. Uh, so I would urge you to read some of his publications from the King's College. They've done a lot of work from it. In fact, an Indian group, uh, uh, Birur, they have done some work on mobile phone applications also, and this is a study that is in progress. Uh, there are also some of these models that have been practiced in Cambodia and in Malaysia as well. Uh, of course, a lot of buzz about screening adjuncts, but there seems to be lack of much of evidence. The way to go would be sort of you to use a novel test like you know salivary or serum based biomarkers a lot of exciting work in progress and i would urge you all to sort of you know read the the plethora of data that is coming up in the novel biomarker especially the salivary and serum based biomarker data is there but finally i must say that i've told you a lot but then oral cancer prevention is definitely about promoting oral health good hygiene tobacco abstinence you would do you would make a lot of impact of course this is uh, sort of, although it's common knowledge, but I thought that I should end my talk by this oral cancer awareness. There are a lot of models. The Cuban model is also there about oral cancer awareness, where then by oral cancer screening, they reduced their incidence in terms of uh, oral cancer stages. A lot of patients in one and two stages. Of course, I told you about the evidences of oral screening and there is an enormous potential for research. So in briefly, I thought I would I, I gave you all a holistic perspective. I know it's a very, I've touched a lot of ground, you know, right from uh, say prevention, uh, oral cancer screening to oral cancer management guidelines to palliation. I've touched base with almost all the randomized control trial and systemic uh, meta-analysis and reviews that have actually come. In fact, I've tried to give you as contemporary as possible till the latest. And I would sort of, you know, stop now and I would sort of, you know, I hope this would be a useful compendium for you. And I would sort of urge you all to sort of ask any questions uh, so that I can sort of, you know, and I hope this initiative uh, from me was useful for you. Thank you, Som. Thank you, NB, for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Sharvin. Superb job. You know, you must have had a lot of sleeplessness nights. Your personal weekends gone to prepare this beautiful uh, talk, you know, fantastic. Uh, thank you very much for doing this job beautifully. There are a lot of questions. Uh, first question, sir, in early oral cancer, PN1 without any adverse factor, observation or adjuvant radiation? How to decide? Uh, it is written by Manish. So, right, right, right. I, I know some of our uh, students are very smart, you know, so they, they tend to ask a very compelling sort of questions. But again, uh, I, I must tell you, it's a very important uh, question. Uh, there are differences in practice uh, where some groups tend to give radiation for any node positive, some groups say more than one, and that's what the ASCO guideline actually says. But I must say that, you know, you, you, uh, what you must do is uh, whenever you have a node positive, you tend to sort of, you know, uh, see whether there's an isolated risk factor or whether there are some other risk factors. So I would urge you all to read the entire pathology report in its entirety and see if there are two or three other soft indications, the inclination would be to give radiation therapy. However, if there is some sort of a, only an isolated factor, and it, it can happen very rarely, I suggest that you go and discuss with your pathologist to see the extent of the disease within the node. If it's a micro metastasis and you've done a fantastic job with your margins, everything you've got very clean, if, and if the metastasis is, is a small, low volume metastasis in the node, you may sort of you know observe some of these patients but then if you see that the metastasis is a very large metastasis coming up to the capsule then there could be an indication to consider adjuvant so i think you must take it on a case on case basis but it's very important that you sort of you know have a good pathologist who can give you a synoptic reporting of all the 
uh, important soft adverse factors also. So you must read every page or every line of the pathology report and not just the final impression. That is what I would urge uh, youngsters to do because each of these you know, has their own connotations. So I, in short, I think um, that would be my practical approach. Thank you. Uh, both uh, Santosh Kumar and also Raj, uh, Sanjeev Kumar asked the same question. Sir, how do we measure DOI clinically? Can clinically DOI be assessed? Uh, uh, that's a very, very important question. And that's that's where uh, I think a lot of examiners tend to sort of, you know, uh, put pressure on the people. It, it is very difficult to assess clinical uh, depth of invasion. Although the uh, TNM, uh, the clinical TNM, the depth of invasion is actually included in the clinical TNM. So the examiners may actually ask you about this, but uh, in practice, it is very difficult to measure. All you can say is whether it's a thin tumor or a thick tumor. And within the oral cavity also, tongue is the only subsite in which you can do a bi-manual or a palpation or palpation or bi-digital palpation of the tumor. If the tumor is there in the buccal mucosa also, to some extent, you can do it. But if it is there in any other subsite, say, for example, especially in the RMT, in the palate, it is very impossible to, 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 to do the depth of invasion. So what the examiner wants is to, to you to commit in terms of you know, whether you have actually looked for the tumor thickness or the depth of invasion of these patients, essentially. So they will. You, there are a lot of fallacies. Of course, you would sort of you know rely on the imaging also a little more, but this is something that you must commit during your examination that you made an attempt to measure the depth of invasion because the examiner will know that you know you are up to date with your concepts. But very interesting, important practical tip is I would I, I don't want you to sort of go and chase and pinch every very tumor. No, it will be slightly painful for these patients. And it's very practical to do it only in cases of oral tongue cancers because it's very easily accessible to uh, to buy digital palpation. Absolutely. And remember, students, uh, there are two to three things. As Arvind told, you must say uh, when this question comes in exam, did you do it? Sir, I'm aware that the depth of invasion is a very important prognostic factor, both for local lymph node metastasis, recurrence and planning adjuvant. I tried to clinically make do it. You can say it looked to be thick or thin. And also remember in TNM, like how you have a CTNM, PTNM, TNM accepts clinical TNM means an extension of an ultrasound and some part of imaging to be part of clinical. So when they say clinical, so you can say that clinically it looks to be a thick tumor. I would try to do an MRI if facility finances are not a problem or I would try to assess then if that is not available in the ultrasound. So some of the investigation tool evaluation also fits into clinical TNM. Clinical doesn't mean your finger, eye and hands alone. So that's a safe way as he told and very important to always remember spiro and spiro. Uh, remember spiro and spiro in head and neck comes in tongue, comes in salivary gland tumors, also in thyroid. So please read which are the landmark trial of spiro and spiro and spiro in uh, tongue cancers and thyroid and also salivary gland tumor. So this is a very important question which I ask examiner Arvind always asks and this is a diplomatic answer. We want to know that it is important. You made an attempt. You analyze it looks to be a thick tumor and I'll follow it with MR or ultrasound sir to know it. Uh, Rhythm Shah is asking sir should we recommend adjuvant RT just because DOI is 5 millimeter even when node is negative and no other adverse factor. I presume it must be for tongue. Yeah, he has written CA for tongue. Yeah. Yeah, no, as I said, like, you know, uh, there is a study called the ARES study that is going on uh, right now at the TMH. Sudhir Nair is leading that study. This is a sort of a gray area when it comes to evidences. Uh, but I, I must tell you all that, you know, uh, it's very important to, again, I would reiterate the concept of, you know, pathologists reporting in a synoptic manner. So you must understand uh, and you sort of, you know, reading that synoptic report. There is a lot of information if you sort of, you know, read one good synoptic pathology report, you will be able to get abundant information with regards to the prognosis and with regards to the need for adjuvant treatment. I know a lot of examiners, you know, they tend to sort of, you know, uh, push you by saying one, two. but the general consensus, what I must tell you, like, you know, if there are two, two or three adverse factors, I think there is a sort of, you know, consideration 
in the absence of note to sort of you know give some amount of radiation therapy again i must say that this is work in progress there are uh, randomized control trials uh, which is ongoing uh, but till that time i think in the clinic you will have to make a practical call by sort of you know looking at the report in detail and if it's an isolated factor again as i said like you know it's very important that you know you go back to your pathologist and actually recheck on some of the other parameters and i think you should be able to make a decision one way or the other in the vast majority of your patients remember uh, that's absolutely right and sometimes some institution between 5 to 7 mm tend to replace with interstitial brachytherapy if it is a accessible oral area and reserve the external beam radiation for salvage recurrences later or second primaries because anybody who is successfully treated cured of uh, head and neck malignancies has a 4% chance of developing another second uh, metachronus second primary in upper aortic distal tract and you can preserve the ebrt for those organ preservation protocol than exhausting on a small factors like this so one of the play in multidisciplinary tumor board on case to case basis people sometimes consider interstitial brachy alone so it is neither over treatment under treatment uh, next is uh, jakula shrikanth asks sir can you please tell what you told about metronomic therapy what it means i presume this must be the first year entrant in the surgical onco I remember after your MS DNB, you are here, and suddenly one term called metronomic comes. Uh, so, for their benefit, in one line, Arvind, what is metronomic therapy? Right, right. No, I think that's a very, very important uh, concept for you all to understand. Like now, normally, the systemic therapy. Whenever you give systemic therapy, you do some sort of you know randomized controlled trials in which you actually see for the dose, no. So you tend to in phase one, phase two, phase three trials, you tend to sort of you know give the maximum tolerated dose. A tolerable dose for these patients so that, that you know and you minimize the side effects and that's how you tend to sort of you know calculate the efficacy safety and efficacy of some of these drugs but what happens is that there is also another concept of metronomic therapy wherein you give a low dose of therapy and this therapy you sort of you know give it for a protracted period of time so that it sorts of you know acts against maybe the the pericytes of the tumor you no know, and the endothelium of the tumor so what uh, it says no it it is a low dose so normally the dosage in your regular systemic therapy will be close to the mtd that is a maximum tolerable dose but in cases of metronomic therapy what happens is you give a much much lower dose so the advantage of giving this metronomic therapy is that these doses are very very easily tolerated and there are hardly any side effects of these patients and it is known that by 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 and I, I actually showed one of the publications from the Tata group also uh, quite exciting. They tried to combine the both the aspects. So especially if it's a uh, sort of you know a borderline resectable or technically unresectable cancer, what that group has done, and I would urge you to read this paper. I think Kumar Prabash is the uh, sort of corresponding author in this paper. Kashyap I think has written this paper in e cancer, which is published in December 21. What they have tried to tended to do is they have to combine the advantages of both so both the modalities of treatment have their own advantages mtd the maximum tolerated dose also has its advantages in terms of cell kill and you also have the uh, the metronomic as way to go of course they gave the three drug metronomic so when you combine the advantages of both these trials then you find that you know one way or the other you're trying to act on the cells so it is uh, trying to get a uh, efficient cell kill. So the metronomic concept was is, is something that is actually practiced for pretty, it's an older concept, but it is getting revived for a lot of different reasons. And in case of or in head and neck cancers, I think there is uh, the two things. One is called the two drug metronomic therapy. It's called methotrexate and celecoxib and the three drug metronomic therapy in which they add erlotinib to the uh, thing. And the three drug metronomic therapy seems to be a very, very exciting concept, especially in the platinum refractory setting. That is, if your uh, oral cancer patient has actually failed within six months of exposure to platinum, what we find is there is a gap in your normal practice as to how to treat these patients. And this is where I think, of course, you have the immune oncology drugs available, nivolumab and all are actually recommended for this. But as I said, from the Indian standpoint, it is very, very difficult for majority of the patients to afford these therapies. And so they go to the metronomic way and we tend to use metronomic chemotherapy to very liberally to all our patients who are not able to afford the and three drug metronomic therapy, especially in the patients 
who are platinum refractory uh, head neck cancer. So this is a very exciting uh, thing. In fact, they are actually using that also as a window. Also, there is a, some trial also from uh, from Sudhir Nair's group. Also, they are trying to sort of uh, use it as a window during the waiting period. For normally, what happens is in head and neck cancers, you have a lo very very long waiting period. So what you tend to do is either you send your patients to some other center to operate, or in high volume centers, they tend to use this as a window of opportunity trials. So that is where I think the intelligence is there. When you are finding in your clinical practice a plethora of patients, a huge waiting list not to do. So what you do, you tend to sort of you know, devise a study in which you sort of you know use the opportunity or the challenge of having an increased waiting list, convert it into an opportunity, devise a randomized control trial, and use some of these therapies in that concept. And maybe somewhere down the line you may hit gold and and ultimately it may benefit some of these patients uh, i'm sorry i gave a protracted reply but i thought it's, it's very well uh, told and students you must understand there are two types of um, you know uh, endpoints we have in oncology uh, curative treatment and then palliative treatment so whenever you use it for new adjuvant adjuvant with a curative intent then the side effects dose doesn't matter because at the end of it you're going to have a cure or a overall survival prolongation that's where as uh, arvind told maximum tolerable treatment prescribed for the drug which is this is the highest limit where benefits are maximum side effects can be managed the ratio of benefit response so you achieve highest response so surgery or radiation can take over and have a good local regional control that's for cure we have another setup where all the established modality of treatment are completed they're failed recurrent then we are intention is palliation palliation means we don't want to, the tumor is not going to go away our aim is not to fully achieve a response but to maintain a status quo where it doesn't matter where it is the pressure symptom hormones released by tumor necrosis factor and all these hormones released by them and the growth of those hormones causing pain local effect needs to be checked so that is where you have a metronomic therapy palliative intention intention is not to give maximum dose to shrink and achieve response because there's nothing more following after that surgery or chemo but maintain a status quo with excellent quality of life with low side effects with a stable disease and that is what you meant by metronic therapy as arvind told read about two drug and three drug regime a lot of questions are there we may have to end uh, sir what is your thought process on uh, submandibular grand preserving neck nodes dissection by manish uh, no, I think the, uh, it's a very inter interesting question, essentially, like, you know, uh, generally what happens is if you see the guidelines, you no, know, they send, they tell that, you know, you have to do a selective neck dissection, at least in oral cavity cancers, you sort of, you know, clears uh, based on uh, levels one to three, uh, or based on the level two status, you tend to decide whether you, two A status, you tend to decide what to go. Uh, but generally, I must say in, in a short answer, it's better to clear, but there, there have been some sort of studies which have actually looked like, uh, and this is also another easy study for you all. So, because I'm sure a lot of institutions, neck dissection is one of the commonest thing to do. So what you all can do is you go back to your pathology reports and see how many times the submandibular gland is actually involved. So many times what has happened is the gland was actually involved in a very, very small percentage of patients. So this was the compelling argument that you know why not preserve the gland because it gives some amount of saliva and no it gives some so, so all those things were there but i think it has not been proven oncologically and i must tell you that if you try to do some of these surgeries you may sort of you know miss out some of the nodes which are present around the submandibular gland in which you may do an incomplete job essentially so although it's an exciting sort of a thought process uh, to start of stimulate some thought i think from all the practical recommendations it's preferable to clear the submandibular gland as well absolutely or there is something called as a submandibular gland transfer no? dr alok patak when he was there in the tmh now of course he's in canada he was trying to do that as a part of you know preserving because submandibular gland actually constitutes a lot of saliva so when you're doing the transfer you actually take it away from the field but again with latest technologies of you know imrt vmat igrt you can sort of you know give the doses and avoid the submandibular so this was something exciting that you know that happened when i trained at the tmh of course the concept is now uh, was there but uh, I, i'm not uh, i don't think uh, anybody actually practices uh, the submandibular gland transfer nowadays 
Absolutely. So, you know, conservatism in squamous cell carcinoma head and neck is very dangerous, should be done very carefully in selected. If you have such a patient where in N0 you want to do that, probably now more and more people are switching over to a SLNB. The concept is, uh, you know, we have parotid which predominantly produces serous which has enzymes submandibular which is mixed mucus and serous sublingual more of mucus and less of serous problem in radiation is it affects serous component first and later it affects the mucinous that's why if you don't have totally saliva it is sometimes okay problem is uh, parotid serous component gone on, serous component or subbendable are gone mucus component come then that sticky stickiness foreign body sensation is what uh, kills the people and troubles them a lot and people have tried a lot uh, but i think at this moment it is only as a part of clinical trial if you have such a patient then maybe you should work try slnb last question and i learned a lot of questions are there manish asks sir in the final histopathology margin is negative but less than 5 mm because there is no frozen available and don't carry too much and frozen as arvin clearly told it didn't make much survival benefit okay so if the margin is 5 millimeter close but negative should we go back and reoperate or give radiation yeah again uh, i think it's a, it's a it's a difficult thing if, if you see the <clears throat> the guidelines you know what they say is that um, you go back and resect that's what they would say for a positive margin but in this case your your margin is slightly closed but uh, as i said like you know you uh, again you tend to sort of you know look at the whole thing holistically whether there is a need for this if there is if you have done a good uh, surgery oncologically removed all all the things and if there's an one isolated margin that is say close then i guess you know you may be really good because I, 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 although i said that you know there are a lot of other trials and they and sneha uh, snehal patel's paper from the uh, mskcc they actually looked at their data and they found that a 2.2 millimeter margin was reasonable for them. And there is also some uh, group from the UK in which they said three millimeter margin over cancer. So I don't want to sort of, you know, give a message to the larger trainee audience that, you know, you go for two millimeter or three millimeter margin or something like that. And I did make it very clear that you go for a centimeter and a half or two centimeters so that histologically two things happen. One is of course, tumor shrinkage happens by around 30% and further shrinkage happens because of formalin fixation. So after that, your margin has to be five millimeters and that is what you must aim on. If by chance at some particular area, one isolated margin and uh, sometimes it, it generally tends to be one of the margins, maybe a deep margin or something, is slightly lesser. And if everything else is okay, uh, then I think um, you can sort of observe, observe. but anything that is much closer i think the recommendation says that um, you go back but of course it's very very difficult to go back and sort of you know do a uh, do a proper job you know whatever has to be done has to be done intraoperatively correctly and it it, it all uh, you never know where you actually have to go when you want to go back although the guidelines recommend go, going back for a closer margin or a positive margin practically you know you you don't really know where you are sort of you know taking the additional tissue and also very important, most of the time you would have put a flap there and going and it's not feasible. Very lucky you might be that you're in a mid buccal mucosa or a tongue and you're done a primary. You can go revise and revise it. Otherwise, uh, it's impossible to go back. Uh, thank you. Last question. Kumar says, sir, in T4 oral cancer, resectable versus non-resectable. So what is the current role of neoadjuvant chemo? In exam, should we say neoadjuvant chemo followed by surgery or no matter what it is, you have a skin involvement pretty orange, but you operate. So where do we, what are the answer you give in exam? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very tricky. And in fact, most of the cases that come to you will be some of these cases, essentially. I think the thing is very clear. If it is resectable, then of course you should say upfront surgery. There is absolutely no doubt of it. All the things about mandibular preservation, I told you sort of, you know, because youngsters nowadays, you know, they tend to sort of, you know, ask for this knowledge. And if, if I give a talk without that, you know, they may see that they may feel that it's not contemporary. So sometimes you are also forced to give some sort of an exciting new knowledge also to you guys. But resectable, go ahead and resect. Again, clearly unresectable, there is again no doubt. There is this group of borderline Resectable and the, the TMH group, they have come up with some criteria. But again, if you see, not everybody will sort of you know uh, buy that criteria. Like you know, there may be some people who may, like for example, in the uh, in the TNM staging itself, for T4B, any masticator involvement is T4B, but it is not 
not that because of, and the general thinking is if it's a T4B, you have to give neoadjuvant chemotherapy. It is not like that. In fact, T4B is subdivided into three major parts, infra-notch T4B and selected supra-notch T4B also, especially in buccal mucosal cancers, are amenable for R0 re resection. So I must say that, you know, it's again a, a clinical judgment that you make as a surgeon, discuss in your multidisciplinary tumor board, have your radiologist on board, see the extent of the tumor. If you are able to get an R0 resection for these patients and by uh, and in in majority of the cases you may have to put a, f a free flap if you are able to if you are doing such extensive resections i think that is the best chance that you are actually getting and even when you give neoadjuvant chemotherapy believe me it is the the survival advantage was only for the patients who were actually downstate so that surgery could be performed in that patients so surgery has the predominant role in the oral cavity. So you must sort of, you know, try to push for surgery and not just in the exams, but in, for every patient, you have to push for surgery if you are wanting to achieve some semblance of cure for these patients. Thank you. The whole concept is neoadjuvant chemo didn't change the margin status, doesn't add uh, better local control, doesn't have survival, unlike other places like breast, uh, rectum, larynx, hyperpharynx. That's why this is a gray area. I know that you have to commit in exam as Arvind say, always says, sir, if it is resectable, no matter what it is, I'll operate. If it is not resectable as per the T4B criteria of AJCC, then I'll consider concomitant chemo radiation to evaluate for surgery. If examiner pushes in this case, what you say, then be humble and try to commit and if you think it's wrong, accept it. I'm not aware of it. Arvind, superb. There are questions pouring in. We have to write write an encyclopedia that shows the popularity of your talk and subject. We will revisit it maybe six months later. I invite you again for this new batches come. Superb. Thank you very much. You know, I wish on behalf of DNB I could have taken you for a lovely dinner, but I will take it on behalf of me and student out. Uh, superb work. Thank you. We overshot our time, but we never felt it. Uh, students, on your behalf, myself, DNB board, heartfelt thanks to Arvind on a Saturday, spending so much time and many weeks to prepare this. Thank you. Heartfelt thanks to you, Arvind. Have a nice day. Yeah. Thank you, Son. Thank you, NB, for the opportunity. My pleasure. Thank to you connect. very much, uh, Professor Avin Krishnamurti, for the presentation. And thank you very much, Professor Dr. Soma Shekhar, for joining us. And thank you, trainees and faculty members, for joining us. Thank you, Navneet Singh. Thank you. Thank you.